mantras of our divine mother a divine mother says our mind must be silent and quiet but our heart must be full of an ardent aspiration with my love and blessings says our divine mother words of our divine mother from the collective works of our divine mother volume 8 question and answers page 103 date 4th april 1950 so one child reads out a passage from synthesis of yoga page 113 on one side he the seeker bees aware of a witness recipient observing experiencing consciousness which does not appear to act but for which all these activities inside and outside us seem to be undertaken and continue on the other side he is aware at the same time of an executive force or an energy of process which is seen to constitute drive guide all conceivable activities and to create a myriad forms visible to us and invisible and use them as a stable support for its incessant flux of action and creation entering exclusively into the witness consciousness he becomes silent untouched immobile he sees that he has still now passively reflected and appropriated to himself the moments of nature and it is by this reflection that they acquire from the witness soul within him what seemed a spiritual value and significance but now he has withdrawn that aspiration and mirroring ascription or mirroring identification he is conscious only of a silent self aloof from all that is in motion around him all activities are outside him and at once they cease to be intimately real they appear now mechanical detachable and devil sweet mother what is the witness soul a divine mother says it is the soul entering into a state in which it observes without acting a witness is one who looks at what is done but does not act himself so when the soul is in a state in which it does not participate in the action does not act through nature simply draws back and observes it becomes the witness soul a divine mother says if one wants to stop the outer activities this is the best method one withdraws into one's soul to the extreme limit of one's existence in a kind of immobility an immobility which observes but does not participate does not even give orders that's all when one wants to detach oneself from something from a certain moment or activity or a state of consciousness this is the effective method one steps back a little watches the thing like that as what one could watch a scene in a play as one would watch a scene in a play and one does not intervene and a moment later the thing does not concern you any longer it is something which takes place outside you then you become very calm only when you do this 
you never remedy anything in the outer moment it remains what it is but it is no longer affecting you we have said this already earlier it is only a first step it helps you not to feel much troubled by things outside but things remain as they are indefinitely it is a negative state is this what sri aurobindo speaks about when he says the separative aspect is liberative in page 115 of synthesis of yoga sweet mother for this our divine mother says yes it liberates precisely it's just that one practices it for that you don't see for liberation in order to be free from attachments free from reactions free from consequences those who understand the gita in this way tell you that they don't understand much further than that they tell you why do you want to try and change the world the world will be always what it is and remain what it is you have only to step back to detach yourself to watch it as a witness watch as something which does not concern him and leave it alone that was my first contact with the gita in paris says our divine mother i met an indian who was a great gita enthusiast and a great very great lover of silence he used to say when i go to my disciples if they are in the right state I don't need to speak so we observe silence together and in the silence something is realized but when they are not in a good enough state for this I speak a little just a little to try to put them in the right state and when they are in a worse state still they ask questions says our divine mother smiling question sweet mother but he was the one who did not want to change the world wasn't he the one who said we are revolutionaries for this our divine mother smiles and says oh that's to excuse your question no that was one way of understanding the gita these people always quote i believe in a truncated form the sentence about there being no fire without a smoke perhaps this was a true a thousand years ago or 500 years ago but now it is stupidity so you can't use the sentence to explain things why do you worry about the state the world is in there is no fire without smoke it is not true but still it is one point of view i think every point of view is necessary if each one keeps to his own place does not try to impede the others if he had just added my experience is like that it would have been all right but he used this to criticize what others were doing and that's where he is wrong question sweet mother that means he was not truly sincere for this a divine mother says perhaps he was sincere in his own conviction he believes he is sincere sweet mother for this our divine mother says he is convinced he has neglected perhaps out of politeness to tell me about the fourth state which was still worse that in which after asking the question one begins to discuss the answer that's really the limit if you arrive at the conception of the world as an expression of the divine in all his complexity then the necessity for complexity and diversity has to be recognized and it be impossible for you to want to make others think and feel as you do each one says our divine mother each one should have his own way of thinking feeling and reaction why do you want others to do as you do and be like you and even granting that your truth is greater than theirs though this word means nothing at all for from a certain point of view all truths are true they are all partial but they are true because they are truths but the minute you want your truth to be greater than your neighbors 
you begin to wander away from the truth this habit of wanting to compel others to think as you do has always seemed very strange to me this is what i call the propaganda spirit and it goes very far you can go one step further and want people to do what you do feel as you feel and then it becomes a frightful uniformity in japan i met tolstoy's son who was going around the world for the good of mankind's great unity and his solutions was very simple everybody ought to speak the same language lead the same life dress in the same way eat the same things and i am not joking those were his words i met him in tokyo and he said but everybody would be happy all would understand one another nobody would quarrel if everyone did the same thing there is no way of making him understand that it was not very reasonable he had to set out to travel all the world for that and when people asked him his name he said tolstoy and now tolstoy you know people said oh some people didn't know tolstoy was dead and they thought what luck we are going to hear something remarkable and then he came out with that well that's only an exaggeration of the same attitude anyway i can assure you that there comes a time when no longer one feels any necessity at all of convincing others of the truth of what one thinks sweet mother says the child when someone criticizes what i am the truth that i am realizing when other criticizes for that our divine mother says yes you may politely tell him mind your own business but you must leave it at that you want to convince someone who criticizes that he is wrong to criticize the more you tell him the more will he be convinced that he is right sweet mother says the child not him but others who follow for that our divine mother says oh you are afraid that they will make adverse propaganda it doesn't matter at all we had an instant like that which was very amusing someone whom i don't want to name came here and wrote in front of the leading french newspapers an absolutely stupid article which was well which showed the stupidity of the man and extremely violent against the ashram that's not the reason i call him a fool but still well the result of one of the results of this article that we received a letter from someone i had read the article i want to be to the i want to go and be in the ashram immediately this can have just the opposite effect says our divine mother question from march 21st 1956 page 94 in the same volume the child says sweet mother here it is written there is one fundamental perception indispensable towards an integral knowledge it is to realize the divine in its essential self and truth in the book synthesis of yoga in page answers 106 question sweet mother how can one understand the divine for this a divine mother says by being him my child by being him my child and that is the only way by identity our divine mother says as sri aurobindo says we know the divine and become the divine because we are that already in our secret nature it is because he is the very essence of our being that we can become him and consequently understand him otherwise it would be quite impossible question sweet mother how can we find the divine within ourselves a Our divine mother says well it is precisely what i have just said what does that mean exactly by what method well first of all you must begin to seek him then that must be the most important thing for you in life the will must be constant 
the aspiration constant, the preoccupation constant, and it must be the only thing you truly want, then you will find him. But of course, if in one's life one thinks of him for five minutes and is busy with other things for the three quarters of an hour, there is not much a chance of success. Anyway, it will take many lifetimes. It may not be a pastime. It must be the exclusive preoccupation of one's being, the very reason of one's existence, says our Divine Mother. Twenty-ninth Feb, nineteen fifty-six, page seventy-four. On this evening, during. These are the words of our Divine Mother.